and welcome to the January 26, 2016 Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. Um, the first order of business is to approve the minutes of the December 9th, 2015 meeting, which I did not attend. Um, do we have sufficient votes here to approve those minutes? I think we do. Any discussion? Move to approve. Second. All in favor? All right. So that's approved five nothing. Uh, we have no old business to discuss, so we'll move on to new business. Uh, the first item is to hear the administrative appeal of Mary Adelikowski, owner of the property at 172 Two Lights Road, map U15, lot 5 of the notice of violation issued by the code enforcement officer for using, ex for using an accessory structure as a rental unit. Um, before we start, um, Mr. Wagner, um, do you want to just give us some background, um, Ben? Sure. Yeah. Excuse me, Chair. Um, I'm going to recuse oh. myself from this application. I've worked with both these people, um, Ms. Tulikowski and Ms. Mr. Wagner as well. Thank you. <clears throat> This all started back in August. I was doing routine research for my enforcement of the short-term rental ordinance. I saw an Airbnb advertisement for the subject property. I contacted the owner and explained that based on the evidence in front of me, she cannot use the structure as a rental unit. Uh, she was persistent that she wanted to continue renting the structure. I explained that she'd need to provide more evidence to demonstrate that renting the structure was legal. A couple months went by and I heard nothing from the owner. I went online to her Airbnb advertisement and realized that she had rented it many more times since we spoke on the phone. Then realizing that a verbal discussion of the violation was unsuccessful, I issued a written notice of violation. Subsequently, I met with the owner and then with the owner and attorney Wagner on November 19th. We began discussing how to remedy the violation, but no agreement was reached. The discussion to remedy the violation centers on how an accessory structure can be used in Cape Elizabeth and specifically if, if an accessory structure can be used as a homestay. I concluded that renting an accessory structure in this manner is not consistent with the homestay provisions of the zoning ordinance. And you know, I think that part's important because we have the notice of violation and then, and then we have the discussions of how it went to remedy the notice of violation and I think that's pertinent tonight. The subject property is a non-conforming lot in the RA zone. The lot is plus or minus 13,000 square feet, where the minimum lot size in the RA zone is 80,000 square feet. Uh, the structure in question is a 14 by 20 foot accessory structure uh, located a few feet to several feet from Two Lights Road. Up until 2009, the tax assessor characterized the structure as a shed. There are many details of this case that can be argued, but it, for me it comes down to one question. Can an accessory structure be refinished and rented like a motel unit? This is a fully functioning dwelling unit based on the Airbnb advertisement. This is a quote from the Airbnb advertisement. This charming cottage has a full bath with shower, kitchenette, comfortable sleeping loft, and living area with a queen-size futon for additional guests." End quote. During the summer and fall months, the structure was rented for $125 a night. The zoning ordinance requires that the use of an accessory structure must be clearly incidental to the principal use on the property. The nightly rental of this former shed is clearly not incidental to the primary use on the property of single family dwelling. Thanks. Yeah. And before we get into the presentation, um, the standard of review just before we start to hear a lot of evidence that's well, potentially not re properly before us. Um, what's your understanding of our review of your decision? We, we've had some trouble at, in Superior Court and Federal Court with them deciding what the Zoning Board standard of review is. We. Uh, back a year or more ago, in one case, uh, we decided 
that the review was not de novo, and then it went to Superior Court, and the case got remanded and said it should have been a full de novo review. In the Verizon case, federal court told us that we should be not conducting a de novo review and conducting an appellate review. The town attorney now has another case going on where he had to say whether the zoning board is doing a de novo or appellate review, and he feels that the federal case was stronger than the superior court case. Uh, therefore, he, he said that he is, he says the town should be doing an appellate review, that the zoning board should be conducting an appellate review, and that's how he's representing himself in court right now, and that's the, the most defensible position. And by appellate review, I mean, for the purposes of the appeal of your decision, an appellate review meaning simply on the record that was before you? That's my understanding of what an appellate review is, is the, the, the record that's being reviewed is, is the record that was on the table at the time of the decision. Uh, so essentially the, 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 the zoning board is not, is not hearing additional evidence. Is not, the zoning board is not supposed to hear additional evidence in order to come to its own decision, but it's supposed to look at the evidence that the code enforcement officer was privy to when he made his decision and base the decision of whether the code enforcement officer made the right decision based on the information at hand. Okay. So that said, do we, do we have any materials that uh, don't fall into that category that, that maybe we shouldn't be taking into consideration. And that's, that's the reason I'm raising this, because, I mean, I, I believe what's been submitted, and we'll obviously give um, Attorney Wagner a chance to speak, but th this has a, a considerable amount of additional information that was not before you, um, an argument based on that additional information. Um, I mean, such as a declaration from Bruce Smith that wasn't um, letters from neighbors Mm -hmm. um, and some other information. Um, <clears throat> the board have any? Uh, I'm just I'm concerned before we proceed that we are <clears throat> considering this in the proper capacity and considering the proper evidence to avoid any issue down the road. And I will say I got this email from the town attorney yesterday, or else. There would have been more pre-planning. I probably would have reached out to you and discussed it, but I, I, I got this information yesterday afternoon. If I could be heard on this point, um, I don't really think it'll make much difference because most everything Ben would have had beforehand, with the exception of the letters from neighbors, which I think are, although interesting, irrelevant to the question of law. and the declaration from Bruce Smith, the former CEO, which is consistent with what his certificate of occupancy said and what his building permit uh, that he issued. So I don't think it should make any difference vis-a-vis uh, -vis the question of law that's before the board today. Um, and anyway, it's the protocol that is provided to me as the attorney is that I submit materials to, to you, and Ben had these in advance, he could have still said, all right, I'm convinced, and we need not go forward with this ZBA appeal. So he had that opportunity, and he did not take it. Okay, I mean, I think we'll proceed, and we'll see what happens <laughs> going forward. But then I guess on the question of the, the other question of de novo versus uh, whether or not you're kind of reviewing him for whether he made a, an error of law versus looking at it fresh, I would argue that you should do it de novo. Um, but even if you don't, and you just look to see if he committed an error of law, I contend that he committed an error of law. So with that, okay. So uh, it's the first time I've been on this side of the podium in three years, so it's, it's good to be back on this side too. Enjoyed my, my time on that side, but uh, welcome, and thank you for having me before you tonight. Um, so there's a simple question. I, I really think this is a simple case, 
and uh, the question presented that I sent to you on January 12th was whether pursuant to the home stay provision of the Cape, Eliz Cape Elizabeth Ordinance, whether Ms. Odolakowski can rent a bedroom in the additional living space that is accessory to the single family dwelling in which she resides, and whether the certificate of occupancy that Bruce Smith, the former code enforcement officer, provided to the appellant uh, would permit her to use it in a home state capacity. Now, I provided um, several exhibits. The, um, I want to address first probably the, the septic capacity issue that was raised by um, Ben McDougal. And the home is permitted as of 2000 when she did her first renovation of the area, for lack of a better term, that's been called the garage building. Well, you can call it an accessory structure as well. Um, it's permitted for 305 gallons per day. That was approved by uh, the state and by the former code enforcement officer, who's the uh, sewage and plumbing person for the town. Now, that is a, a defined term called design flow, 305 gallons per day. And the design flow, although the code enforcement officer points to the fact that you use bedrooms to determine the design flow, the design flow was approved for the, the home as reconfigured in 2000. And then in the application in 2009 that Bruce Smith approved, she specifically said, uh, the, the appellant specifically said that the sump pump was added to run plumbing up to septic. So that was disclosed in the application, uh, the building permit application in September of 2009. And that was the, the permit, which is the same number as the building permit application, was issued on September 11, 2009, giving the appellant permission to refinish, uses the term refinish, because there was already existing, refinish existing garage area to be used as an accessory structure to the existing single family dwelling. Now it says not to be rented as a separate single family dwelling. Now in the course of the proceedings here, prior to coming before the board, when we are communicating with the code enforcement officer, we already conceded the point that you can't have this accessory structure be used as a separate single family dwelling. You can't have on that size lot two separate single family dwellings. It's conceded. So that was one of the starting points that we had with the code enforcement officer. But we quickly came to the realization that you can have a homestay arrangement in Cape Elizabeth, you know, certainly by ordinance since 2009, and most, most likely previous to 2009, that's how it was done anyway. In fact, if you go back in the historical records, which the Historical Society was kind enough to provide to us, her home in 1909, there's some records showing that it was used as a homestay rental as far back as 1909. So the question um, about the septic, getting back to the septic is, whether or not she was required to get a new form HHE 200 to talk about change in use when she did that, uh, when she did the updates in 2009. Now, the code enforcement officer didn't ask for one in 2009, right? And that was his job at the time if he believed it was necessary. He did not request it, and he granted her a permit, and he granted her a certificate of occupancy based on the application that specifically stated that there was going to be a sump pump moving that into the septic, the existing septic. He did not ask for a new one. And I submit to you the reason he didn't ask for one um, is that you're only required to get a new HHE 200 form if there's an increased usage of the septic system. And quote, if current wastewater flow is equal to or less than the wastewater design flow at the time of system installation. So that means it would have to be less than, um, it would have to be greater than or equal to 305 gallons per day. Now, we submitted to you as part of the packet the actual usage uh, at the property uh, from the Portland Water District, that's Exhibit F, 
and over a period of 394 days, it resulted in an average of 227.8 gallons per day, which is uh, well below the design flow that that septic uh, capacity has. Can I interrupt you for a second? Sure. Mr. Wagner? I want to ask Ben a question. Ben, did you have that, the, the historical uh, water usage data when you made your determination? No, I didn't. Okay. So, am I to understand that we're, we're not to take that into consideration? I, first of all, I, I don't know that I agree with the code enforcement officer. I think you were provided with that prior to your final decision. You're, you're talking about the time of the notice of violation or the time before we went to the ZBA? Because I gave you the Portland Water District stuff before we went to the ZBA. Yeah, you, you gave it to me in your final application package two weeks ago. I think even prior to that. Okay, I, I don't recall having it prior to two weeks ago in your final application package, but I, mean, I think we, we can still discuss, I, th I think we can still discuss the septic issue. I do. Okay, I, I, I don't want to bog this down with okay. its technicality, so uh, just okay. continue, sorry. Thank you. Um, the current use of the property consists of the appellant, her daughter, and the one person who's renting a bedroom in the accessory structure. Three people, three bedrooms, same usage, no increased flow. Um, I have a question. Yeah. That. Maybe this isn't the time to think about the question. Um, I would think the issue of, it's not just an issue of flow, it seems to me. It's that if you were going to have flow from the garage, you'd have to show that you were having another bedroom. By not doing that, you didn't divulge that there was going to be an additional bedroom in the garage. And it's, you know, if, if you don't happen to have a lot of people using a lot of septic system, and I don't think the issue for the neighbors and whether this is going to be a rental cottage is a matter of whether you have a couple of elderly people in the house who aren't using much flow and there's adequate flow. Yeah. And the question is, by not divulging that there was effluent coming from the garage, you're suggesting it was nothing more than a man cave, as one of your letters suggested. Yeah, um, I understand your point, uh, but I think that it was certainly divulged, the current, uh, the, the former code enforcement officer. He saw in the application that the septic from the bathroom in the accessory structure was being run up to the septic field. He inspected it and issued a code enforcement, um, a, a certificate of occupancy based upon his inspection. And he, in his declaration before the board, he states that he knew there was an additional bathroom in the accessory structure. Well, the question is about additional bedrooms, and, I th and that's the same code enforcement officer that said this is not to be rented, correct? As a separate single family dwelling. And, and he knew about the additional bedroom, as he says in his declaration. Well, I think th there are two statements in those letters. One says it's not to be rented, and one is at the end, at least in terms of the documents that are the selections from the documents. Um, it, it says not, uh, I forget what the wording is, but the first just says it's not to be rented. I mean, I think it's clearly, <laughs> I mean, the exact wording uh, and the permit was not to be rented as a separate single family dwelling. And the certificate of occupancy, it said, cannot be utilized as a rental unit. And then in his declaration before the board, he stated I did not intend to prohibit its use as a bedroom and consider that a permissible use. I personally inspected the accessory structure and know that it had a renovated bathroom and that it would be used as living space. And not as a rental unit. He doesn't say that. Well, why do you toss he, your head that way? He, that was his bottom line. That's what he said before the board. And what he, to be a, a, 
for family space or whatever you just read. Well, in the key language there is living space. He says you can put a bathroom and living space in an accessory structure without increasing the design flow of your septic system because design flow for septic systems for single family dwellings are based on bedrooms. So if someone does, uh, you know, just accessory living space, uh, bonus room in an accessory structure, that is legal in Cape Elizabeth to have living space in a, and a bathroom in an accessory structure without providing an HHE 200. Which is just how it had if, been used before. If anyone sleeps there, then you've created an additional bedroom and you need an HHE 200 to represent that. So, and, and, and what Ben said is exactly what was used before. The gentleman had an office, it was so full of stuff, people thought it was terrible, and it was just accessory space. It was, and that's what the code enforcement officer approved. Uh, the court of, what the former code enforcement officer said on January 14th was, um, he, uh, he talks about the two different statements that he made. One, that it cannot be occupied. Um, he said it cannot be utilized as a rental unit. By that, I mean the same thing that I wrote in the permit, that it was not to be rented as a separate single family dwelling. Not as a rental unit, ben, you didn't address Ben's point. <laughs> you didn't address Ben's point. That, okay, separate living space is different from separate living space with a bedroom. Maybe I'll come back to you after we wrap it up. Um, the, I appreciate your point. Um, I think, you know, we can agree to disagree on, that, on, on this point. We did highlight the fact that there's only three persons using it. There's an empty bedroom that I don't know if it would make a difference if you took, put uh, bookshelves up and made it into your library or your home office. We could go through that, uh, through that effort to re remove one of the bedrooms from a, not having a bed in it and having a desk in it instead uh, so that it's the third bedroom is in the accessory structure instead of the primary resident. I mean, I, I don't think that should be necessary. I think that would elevate form over substance. In this case. Uh, when you're, the concern of the wastewater, subsurface wastewater disposal rules are about usage and how much usage and whether or not you exceed the design flow, which is 305, and which she has never come close to exceeding, even with a person in, a, in the arrangement and the accessory structure. So I mean, I, that I'm, uh, I apologize, I don't have more for you on that point, but that's what I have. Um, now, the facts show that Mr. McDougall, the current CEO, and Bruce Smith, the former code enforcement officer, both agree that accessory structures can be used as bedrooms. Now, that's, that's certainly clear now um, because Mr. McDougall issued a building permit at 15 Sunrise Drive in Cape Elizabeth that's now came before your board just recently, now is in Superior Court in Portland. And he issued that permit to allow separate accessory structures to be used as bedrooms. That was the stated use for those buildings on the permit application. And he granted that right. So, and it's clear from what Mr. Smith has said, the former CEO, that he also believed that accessory structures could be used as bedrooms. So I don't think there's any question that accessory structures can be used as bedrooms. But the, the, as I recall, in that 15 Sunrise Drive, there was a, a pretty substantial septic system that far exceeded what that one bedroom house needed. If, yeah, if, I, if I may, I mean, I, again, perhaps this is too early to go off in this direction, but I'm actually glad you brought that up. I think it's important to clarify that so that people don't go off in a lot of different directions. Um, the structure here is 280 square feet. As I recall those, I think they were 12 foot square cubes. Um, so each one is half the size. They were bedroom only. There was extensive concern expressed by this board that they not have plumbing. 
the owner said they're not to be rented. They're not to be rented. There was extensive concern expressed by this board that they were not to be rentals. They were not to have plumbing. They had nowhere near the space that this cottage has to have a kitchen, a balcony, futon space. 12 foot square, you can't do that. One of the board members was so concerned he voted against it that the owner would go off and rent them as separate structures. That was the fundamental decision that we made was that's not what this sort of thing is for. And I think we, have, we always have a duty to respect people's property rights. And I think to the extent that we are given the charge with enforcing these statutes, I think we then have to enforce them in a way that enables people to exercise those property rights as much as we can. Obviously, that occasionally makes for individual decision making rather than simple hard and fast rules that are safe and perhaps clear. And I think for that we rely primarily on Ben, who is a paid professional who deals with these things every day, which in that case, he looked at the 12-foot cube as to be a bedroom. We, we got into the square footage of the house and that the people from these cubes were going to have to walk through the bedroom in the house to get to the bathroom, not the kind of thing you're likely to be renting to people. There was extensive conversations about that, exactly the opposite of this situation, exactly the opposite of what the code enforcement officer said when he approved it, that this is not to be a rental. Bedrooms were not discussed. There was no choice here about putting in a bathroom because there was one. I think if it had been de novo, we might not have approved it. Ben might not have said that wasn't an accessory structure. I think the issue there wasn't the architecture. The issue was it's a bedroom, clearly. And that's all it's going to be. This is not just a bedroom. It's a cottage. Your client has said it's a cottage. That's an admission in writing, in public. So I think that I think to bring those up is very appropriate. And I mean it when I thank you for it. Because I would have brought them up if you hadn't. Because I think it's very important that we remember how we arrived at that decision and try to make that clear. You know, I, I'm familiar with that record and I reviewed it. Um, what, but what's clear to me is that it was approved, the approved use was for a bedroom or other uses, um, and that it wasn't limit, limited to bedroom uses. I saw that the applicant backpedaled a little bit because he was worried about the, the bedroom only nomaker, you know, and uh, ended up um, saying, no, well, we could use it for a lot of different uses, not just bedroom. But certainly, um, the permit was issued based on an application requesting bedroom use. That's correct. And, right. and, yeah, and what the appellant is asking for here today is not to have a separate single family dwelling. She's conceded some of the points, as I said before, to the code enforcement officer and said she would like to have a bedroom use and a homestay arrangement. Yeah. Again, the issue here isn't a separate single family dwelling. The issue here is a rental unit intended as a, and used as a separate rental unit. Okay. So I'll... Um... One last little point. I mean, I think, again, the issue of, yes, it was can be used for something other than a bedroom. I mean, I said it at here, and once the thing's built, you can put a lawnmower in there or a bed in there. Mm -hmm. We don't zone what, you, what kind of furniture you can put in a structure once it's built. Right. I think the issue here is when you have a structure that's built in a certain way, it can, it's subject to certain uses and, and certain abuses. And the issue with that was there were no bathroom facilities and there wasn't an available bathroom handy without going through the bedroom of the parents or wherever you're going to rent it to. And so there was some safety in that situation that it was only going to be pertinent to the primary usage of the primary cottage, which was very small and needed another bed. And that was Ben's decision and we didn't second guess it. This is an almost totally opposite situation. Well, I re respectfully disagree that it's totally opposite, that's sir. That's fine. I mean, it's, we're talking about bedroom and that, bedroom. That's an overstatement. That's it's a very different situation. Yeah. Um, the size is different. What's in the facility is different. The expressed intended use 
and prohibitions are the same from the board and the zoning officer. Right. And uh, we happen to agree with his decision in that uh, case that you know it is acceptable to use an accessory structure as a bedroom incidental to the primary use of the residence. Um, I'll, I'll move on to um, the homestay question. Um, uh, inst one last point about the uh, Sunrise Drive property. As my understanding is there was some uh, plumbing that was associated with the accessory unit, some outdoor showers or something which w would require plumbing. Um, no? no, that was in the original application but never acted on. That, that was brought up at the meeting but rescinded. Okay. Um, in any event, I see, I see nothing in the ordinance uh, that would prohibit having a bathroom in those units, uh, in those bedrooms, in any event. Um, now, with regards to the homestay provision, I believe there can be no dispute that the homestay provision in the Cape Elizabeth ordinance permits the rental of one or two furnished bedrooms. It's straight there in the ordinance. It uses the word bedrooms. It uses the words for rent and it uses the words for one or more nights. What it does require is that the, the homestay rental be operated by the person who resides permanently in the house. And we say, we've checked that box. Ms. Odolikowski lives in the house and she'd be renting the homestay unit to someone that lives in the accessory structure in that bedroom capacity. And it requires parking on site. Check once again. So. She falls squarely within the provisions of the homestay arrangement, taking into account, and I know that the code enforcement officer has provided you with the uh, Airbnb um, advertisement, which he asked her to take down, the, uh, the appellant to take down, and she took down after he asked her to do it. And that's no longer advertised that way. So I would contend that what was circulated to you tonight uh, is not relevant any longer. This is not, this is part of the concessions that we already made to the code enforcement officer that it would no longer be rented that way. What we're asking for is to be permitted, pursuant to the ordinance, pursuant to the former code enforcement officer's already existing certificate of occupancy, to rent this bedroom as part of a homestay arrangement. I mean, it, it, to me, it kind of comes back to like an old simple mathematics, the transitive law. If you have a, a bedroom in the house, as treated as a bedroom, as A, and you have a bedroom in the accessory structure that's also treated as a bedroom, as a B, and C is that a homestay arrangement allows a rental of a bedroom in, in a house, A equals B, B equals C, A equals C. They're the same thing. There's nothing in the ordinance that would per, you know, permit you to even deny her use of this uh, accessory structure. It's not there. She's using her property appropriately. Thank you. Oh, one last thing. There was a, a statement made about motels. And I don't know if this was a, a, a throwaway argument, but I think it clearly does not fit into the definition of motel. The same interpretation that would apply under the definition of motel, the accessory structure would apply to the main house as well. Um, that would render, uh, furthermore, the interpretation attributed to the definition of motel by the code enforcement officer would render the homestay provision of the ordinance a nullity. And as uh, the lawyers on the panel know, the law abhors why is that? Stat statutory interpretation would render it a nullity. I want to follow your logic of why calling this a motel renders, it a renders the homestay section a nullity. Because then anytime you have someone stay one or two n nights at a place that has an entrance from the outside into your house, which the homestay provision permits, you could call it a motel and say you can't do it. No, you couldn't. I guess I didn't make my point before. This is a 280 square foot building, bathroom, bedrooms, a balcony. It's advertised as a separate cottage. It is a separate cottage. If you had a second one, there would be two cottages, and three of them would be three cottages, and you'd have a very, you'd have a facility that's very common throughout Maine. This happens to have one. It's not just a bedroom. It's not just a bedroom. It's not just a bedroom. And you can't make it a bedroom by scoffing and saying it is. I, it's not. I don't know There's why you can't change it to a bedroom, sir. I'm sorry? I don't know why you can't change its 
past use to a appropriate current use. We've already conceded the point. Its past use was not as a bedroom. It was, as, as, it was a garage and a storage space with an office. It was converted. It was specific, it specified that not a rental unit, which is exactly what we specified when we approved bedrooms as, separate, as a separate room. I, this I, is not a room. I understand you disagree with my proposition, sir. I do have a question. Um, there's currently an occupant in the yes, sir, separate yes. building. Uh, what is that occupant's arrangement? Is that a, does, does that occupant uh, stay there? Is, is there a leasehold? What's the interest? Does she have a lease? Just informal. Yeah. I know. So she is not a leasehold. She's there and she's not there all the time and she's allowed use of the primary house as well. Okay. So she's considered a tenant at will? Yeah, I think that'd be a fair assessment. And how often is she remitting rental payments? Is that monthly? Monthly. The, the notice of violation cites the March 2015 certificate of occupancy, which states that additional living space accessory to the single dwelling unit cannot be used as a rental unit. Isn't that what it's being used as? In violation, I mean, there's a certificate of occupancy which explicitly states cannot be used as a rental unit. So why is the use where she's renting the unit not in violation of the certificate of occupancy? As a separate single family dwelling, that would be a violation. If she had no use of the primary house, um, but when, when Ben first approached the appellant about this problem and we started discussing it, I told her that she would have to remove some of the other things from the accessory structure, such as a refrigerator, such as the, the microwave. Um, to make it more of a bedroom and a homestay arrangement. But, but the no, I, I, maybe I'm missing something, but the notice of violation, it states that the certificate of occupancy states that the additional living space accessory to the single family dwelling unit, it cannot be used as a rental unit. Right, and we're not, she's not going to use it as a single family uh, rental unit. She wants to are, use are it saying in a homestay arrangement. Unit? by definition means a single family rental unit? Uh, a standalone single family. Where she has the right to use it in a homestay arrangement as a bedroom is our proposition. And that's what I'm submitting to the board. We're not asking for anything more than that. Question for you. <clears throat> does, in your opinion, does the, does the unit meet the definition of a dwelling unit of the ordinance term for dwelling unit? which is on, it's on my page five under definitions. And I'll, I'll just sort of summarize. To, to me, it, it would. It says a room or group of rooms designed and equipped exclusively for use as permanent, seasonal, or temporary living quarters for only one family at a time and containing cooking, sleeping, and toilet facilities. Right. And it does not... Um does not comply with that definition since she's removed the, uh, the cooking facilities. Okay. Yeah. So today, or today it does, it has some sort of kitchenette or something like that or cooking no, facilities? Uh, according to my knowledge, it does not have a kitchenette anymore. Okay. That it did when, this, when the notice of violation issued, it did, and it no longer does. So at, at that time when it did have cooking facilities, in your opinion, would it have met that definition of dwelling unit? Yes, I, I agree with that. And, and by meeting the definition of a dwelling unit, does, does that mean it, it doesn't meet the definition of a homestay? I think then it would no longer just be s simply incidental accessory use of the primary residence, which a homestay arrangement would. Then it would be a, a separate standalone rental, yeah. not incidental to the primary residence. Thank you. I've got, I've got another question. Going back to the, the septic issue, um, in, in 2009, just, just so I have the facts straight, 2009, the former CEO issued a building permit for these improvements. 
um, which included um, interior upgrades as w that included plumbing and electrical work. Um, and as I think everyone agrees, he, he didn't require an HHE 200 at the time. Presumably, if he understood a new bedroom was being created, he would have, or at least he should have um, required that, according to, to Ben and, and, as I understand it, the, the Maine State Plumbing Code. Was that an oversight on his part, or, or in, your, in your eyes, was that, did he understand it? differently? Did, did he understand that there was already a bedroom in there, so it, it wasn't an additional bedroom? I think since there was already an existing uh, toilet facility in the accessory structure, that he would have seen it just as uh, an improvement to it, uh, so that it wouldn't have changed the design flow and, and affect the capacity of the septic system. Um, but it clearly said in the permit application that they were going to install a sump pump to pump it into the existing septic. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. And, and I mean, as I understand things, adding a bathroom doesn't affect design flows. It's, it's adding a, a bedroom. And why he didn't require an, an HHE 200 at the time um, is what I don't understand. Yeah. I mean, I can't speak for Mr. Smith. I sure. Mean, I don't know that it was an oversight or that he felt that it wasn't necessary given that the design capacity at 305 gallons a day was sufficient for the intended use and that there wouldn't be increased uh, flow. Sure, yeah, I, and I, I get that um, today it's not, it, today maybe the flows are less than what, the, what it was constructed, what the design flows were um, and, and how it was constructed, but I think the intent of design flows are um, to design the system so the, 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 the property at capacity would, would con continue to operate. I mean, if you've got, if you add a bedroom and don't increase the design capacity, um, even though you don't occupy the building, if you sell it to the, sell it to someone else and all of a sudden they occupy that additional bedroom, that, the, you know, the flows could be greater than or if you, had, uh, if you had seven people living in a three-bedroom. Sure. Right, which is not prohibited by the ordinance at all. Right. So I guess my point is that I, I'm not so sure the historic, you know, the, the flow usage data is, is relevant um, to, to what should have been approved at the time or, or you know, the, 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 the process of um, going through redesigning or, or designing an upgrade to the system. Yeah, and I understand your point. It's well taken, uh, but I do think that uh, an applicant should be able to rely on a code enforcement officer's uh, inspection <laughs> and approval of the Sure, course. yeah, and I, I'm, I'm not disputing that. I'm yeah. just trying to understand um, what happened in 2009. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Any further questions from the board? Thanks, Jim. All right, thank you. Uh, Do you want to say? Mary wants to just. Hi, I'm Mary Otulikowski, and I live at 172 Two Lights Road. Um, your question in regards to the septic and the f flow design, if you look at the application dated 2009, it says replacing existing plumbing and electrical, which was already there. We just brought it up to code all it was. It was there. Um, in regards to your question about um, the uh, separate single family dwelling, the way it was, ex the way it was explained to me was that um, this cottage, as I call it, the cottage, I can call it a garage, I can call it a shed, whatever you'd like, um, is dependent on the main house. You have to come into the main house to cook a meal, to do your laundry, to use the barbecue in the backyard. This is a, like a room in my home, is all it is. It's a bedroom and a bathroom. That's all it is. And so the way it was explained to me, it could not be rented as a, 
as you, I'm sorry, Mr. Crawford, as you said, uh, it could not be rented as a single, a separate accessory single family unit. It's not. It's rented as a room. You can't cook in a room. You have to use a stove in a kitchen. You have to use those primary gadgets in a kitchen. They have to come into the primary home, my home, via a separate entrance to use that. It's not there. It's a bedroom with a bathroom, just like in my home. Any other questions that I could maybe answer? That, that's what was my definition. It couldn't be rented as that, but I could rent it as a bedroom in my home, which is what I'm doing. Did that answer it? Or did you have a question? My bedroom does not have a refrigerator and a stove. No, those have been removed. No, but your, but your master bedroom, your master bedroom might have a, a, a separate and bathroom I, I with a not, master bath. And I would not advertise my bedroom as a charming. As a well, charming what it's advertised at and what it is, are, is. And this is a rental unit. That's what it is. It, 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 it's a rental, of course. It could be, could, should fall under the homestay because you have to use the main house in order to do anything. You can't cook a meal in it. What? You have to use the yard to barbecue. It had, the refrigerator's been moved. The kitchenette, which is like a dorm room with a microwave and a, and a, a pot of coffee, the, has been removed. It's a room. Just happens to be a separate entrance. That's all. And I, I think you may want to relook, Ben, um, where you said it was considered a shed up until that time. I, I, I haven't seen that. So I, you know, if it was a shed, then it's a shed with a room. So I think we pretty much stated we, uh, you had asked me what I could prove to you prior to me even owning the property, what it was. I think those letters have been submitted. The Historical Society, 1909, it's prior to everything being put in place for the town, for rentals. Just one point of clarification. So Inside the main house, there are three bedrooms, and then there's this additional bedroom in there. Correct. So but I use two of my bedrooms. I'm sorry? There's only two bedrooms in use, my daughter's and That's mine. That's fine. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks. Thank you. Any public comment? Okay. Hearing no public comment, I'd like to open it up for board discussion. Um, just a, a couple issues in my mind to start. First of all, we're hearing an appeal of a notice of violation, and I'm a little bit concerned that we're talking about prospective relief. In other words, what she's intending to use, the pro how she's intending to use the property in the future, which I don't, which I don't necessarily think is before the board. We have a notice of violation that. Ben issued when he found out how the property was being used. So I think as we discuss this, and I'm, I'm obviously open to hear different interpretations, but I, I think we should be sticking to the notice of violation, why the notice of violation was issued, and whether or not the notice of violation was properly issued. And going forward, I don't want to make, I don't think it's properly before us to make a determination about how the property can be used in the future. If that if our determination relating to the notice of violation, if, you know, if consequently that leads to how the property can be used, that's one thing, but I, I think we should stick to the notice of violation. The second issue that I keep coming back to the certificate of occupancy, isn't this being used as a rental unit? It's, it's a unit, and, and rent, I don't think rental unit is defined in the ordinance, I can't find it. But to me, rental unit, I don't care whether there's a refrigerator or a kitchenette or not, it's an accessory structure, it's a unit, it's not a, it's not a, rental, uh, not a rental room, it's a rental unit. 
and the certificate of occupancy says cannot be utilized as a rental unit. Why, why can you rent it if the, certificate of, if the certificate of occupancy says cannot be utilized as a rental unit? So, so in your mind, it doesn't matter whether or not it meets the definition of a homestay or not? Well, and I guess this might be for Ben. <laughs> what is it? I mean, how, is, is, is language in a certificate of occupancy binding on the homeowner? Right. Yes. So I, I, don't, I, I don't see why we go any further. I think at this point, at that point in time, uh, Airbnb didn't exist, and there wasn't maybe a whole lot of uh, market for short-term stays like she's been advertising, where when the code enforcement officer authorized, basically did the certificate of occupancy, uh, he did view it as not a, a single family, a single dwelling unit, because at that point it wasn't a thing out there for people to to do. Well, it wasn't in our packet. We have a 2011 certificate of occupancy. The notice violation references the 2015. Is that a new one, or is that just a typo? That's a typo. Okay, so it was a 2011. Um, this this should be marked. Yeah. Version. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that if he said, "Can I?" Well, he, his his phrasing didn't account for all for all potential rental uses of, of the well. I mean, it says rental unit. To me, to me, rental unit is. Right. I, I don't I, I don't find much ambiguity in rental unit. <laughs> mm -hmm. And again, I could be potentially convinced otherwise. But if the certificate of occupancy is binding on the homeowner, then to me. I don't know if I get any further than the certificate of occupancy. That's not to say that she, that the owner couldn't apply for a new certificate of occupancy. Um, and again, that sort of gets into this, you know, are we talking about prospective relief? Um, here, the current certificate of occupancy prohibits use of that unit as a rental unit. She's renting it out. To me, that's a rental unit. Mm -hmm. And I, and I don't, I mean. No, I, I, I agree, and I think, you know, I'm, again, I'm concerned to some extent about our decision. I mean, if this isn't the rental unit, I don't know what is. I mean, if we're not, if, if, if this is okay to rent as a separate unit in, in, in the face of a, a CO that says no rental units, in the face of all the understandings, in the face of the kind of structure it is, I mean, the next thing that comes along, it's going to be extremely hard, I think, to say, well, this wasn't a rental unit, even though everything about it seemed to be, but the next one is, and so we prohibit it. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure how you're gonna, how you're, where you're going to be if you go down this road. And again, if, if that language wasn't in the certificate of occupancy, I, I think we'd be then you know, potentially, at least in my mind, addressing some of the other arguments that have been raised regarding the septic system, regarding, um, you know, uh, you know whether or not it meets the definition of homestay. But on its face, I can't right now get past the certificate of occupancy. That's sort of a roadblock. Any thoughts from the board? I, I think we're just coming down to like a, a different, what is, what is the definition of rental unit? Unfortunately, the ordinances don't define rental unit, the dwelling unit, but not rental unit. Um, I guess what I think he probably, what was he thinking that it couldn't be used as a, put a kitchen in, put a kitchen in there and rent it out as a, under a separate lease, like the type of say. Did he envision the homestay? I think uh, consonant with what Josh has said, I see you know two 
issues, and maybe it's a subset of the same issue, but um, first off, we have the very clear language that shouldn't, shall not be used as a rental unit, and again, that's a, that's a hurdle for me. Um, that issue even aside, if we look at the spectrum of possible uses for this particular space, we have homestay on one end. Uh, we probably have accessory dwelling unit somewhere in the middle, and then we've got dwelling unit on the far end. Um, I don't think it. I don't think it's a, a homestay uh, because again, I think a homestay is talking about one or two simply separate bedrooms, and it's clear from the notice of violation. I think we're limited to the findings of of what the facts were on the ground at the time that notice was was issued, uh, that this was much more than that. Uh, certainly was not even an accessory dwelling unit at that point, because the ordinance states an uh, uh, accessory dwelling unit needs to be within the, or attached to, the primary single family dwelling. As the facts are laid out within the notice of violation, the supporting materials that, were, that we've, we've reviewed relative to that, it was a separate dwelling unit at the time. And I don't really think we have any choice but to affirm the decision of the code enforcement officer um, relative to that. I don't disagree. And so I would, at this time, make the motion that we deny the administrative appeal of Mary Otulikowski. Sorry about that. Names are tough. Owner of the property at 172 Two Lights Road, map U15, lot 5, with regard to the code enforcement officer's notice violation dated November 9th, 2015. My second. All in favor? Uh, I mean, we'd already had, we'd closed it for comment and then had board discussion, so. What do you want to be heard on? Uh, that's just, I mean, we've already, you've already had your opportunity to speak, and then. Well, that's not rebuttal, that's just discussion. That's just the board discussing your presentation and the evidence in front of us. Um, I'm inclined to deny it. Mm -hmm. I agree. Just, I, think I, mean, unless, I think we've heard what we need to. Yeah, sorry. Um, all in favor? All right, so the, um, uh, that's five nothing to uphold the code enforcement officer's notice of violation dated November 9th, 2015. Uh, then the findings of fact, these are all based on your notice of violation. I mean, I believe they are. I just want to make sure that we're not, this, this just gets into, are we making additional findings of fact? You, you could argue that number six was not contained within my notice of violation. Um, okay. I didn't, you know, in my notice of violation, I didn't get into right. The, the right internet advertisement. And I don't think that's... So I think we should just do the findings of fact one through five, which I'll read in unless um, someone feels differently. Okay, so the findings of fact number one, on November 9th, 2015, the code enforcement officer issued a notice of violation regarding the use of an accessory structure at 172 Two Lights Road, map U15, lot five. Two, the subject lot is a non-conforming lot in the RA zone. Three, the current use of the property is a single family dwelling. Four, building permit number 100117 was approved to refinish the interior of the garage for additional living space accessory to the single family dwelling. Five, the certificate of occupancy dating March, dated March 1st, 2011 states that the space may now be occupied as additional living space accessory to the single family dwelling unit cannot be utilized as a rental unit. All in favor of those findings of fact? 
Uh, yeah. I'm in favor of all of those. I think we probably do want to want to add another one. I don't know whether we want to do the, do that now or after we've approved the first several. I, I think we should probably add something to the extent that if there was a, an inter internet advertisement uh, indicating that the property was being rented. Oh, I mean just picking up on the language in the notice of violation. Yeah, yeah, just something confirming that it was actually. Um, so an internet, an internet advertise, um, even something to the extent that the code enforcement officer uh, verified rental of the structure. Uh, via the internet. Um. And and maybe that's maybe that's subsumed by you know the the fact that the notice of violation is referenced. In, in yeah, the, I mean, I, I think. Number one, it incorporates the notice of violation. Yes. And so the notice of violation speaks for itself. I think that's right. That, that's fine. That, okay. Yeah. Um, so all in favor of the five findings of fact? All right. It's approved uh, five nothing. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the second item of business, which is to hear the request of Daniel Buckley, owner of the property at 5 Orchard Road, map U21, lot 132, to reconstruct and expand a garage on his property based on section 19-4-3B3 of the zoning ordinance. And uh, we'll start, and Ben will uh, please provide a summary of this matter. Mr. Buckley came into the office several months ago uh, requesting to rebuild a non-conforming garage on his property. He explained to me that when the garage collapsed 10 or so years ago, the code officer advised him to get a permit to replace it because it was only a few feet from the property line. He had the right to replace it in, in kind. Uh, he wasn't able to build the whole thing, so he built the foundation at the time. And now he is coming in to me to do the rebuild. Uh, I told Mr. Buckley that he could rebuild in kind, but he couldn't go up very high couldn't go up higher in order to add a second floor to the garage and he doesn't necessarily want to add a second floor but he, he wants to do sort of a gambrel style with, with storage space up there. Uh, I told him that about the tallest I could go would be five feet above the ceiling joist before I started calling it a second floor. Uh, Mr. Buckley wanted a little more storage space up there. He'd like to go to eight feet. So essentially, he's, he's here today to get three feet more of headroom on an accessory structure. Can I ask a question? Um, if, if I'm not interrupting. Um, the three feet, you said, you said you couldn't really go more than three feet before it's a second floor. Is that, that's what you said, correct? Five feet. I mean, more, yeah, more than five feet. Um, I guess my question, is there, is that, is that like a hard number? I mean, no. I see. So the code says something like you can't have a second floor and you decide what a second floor is. Is that correct? Yeah, the code, the code says you can't I increase the amount of floor area. I see. So it, you know, it's, I see. it's a judgment call on when something becomes floor area. And I think if you get, much over five feet, it becomes usable floor area up there. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, I think that would be nice coffee, David. You don't want to put a bedroom up there, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> 
windows. Um, yeah, it's just, it's like Ben said, um, I think it was 10 or 12 years ago, uh, the old garage that was original from the 40s, um, you know, it snowed, rained, and kaboom. Uh, uh, Bruce Smith said that I could replace the, um, uh, or keep, I believe the words were keep the grandfather uh, as long as I put at least the foundation in. So I, I uh, put a block foundation in, dug it and everything. He approved the, the footings. Um, and since then I had, a, I had a temporary, you know, one of those um, shelter logic things on there. Um, the garage is 12 by 18. Um, the gambrel is going to leave me with, um, you know, five feet. And I just want to be able to stand up. I mean, if it's six feet, seven feet, I don't care. <laughs> just don't want to have to bend over storing stuff up there. I also gave, a, I don't know, three examples there in, right on my street. Uh, one's right next door to me that's exactly the same thing and he's probably the corner of his house is probably four or five feet from the from the line can I ask a question sure. <laughs> um, you're you just said you don't really care if it's six or seven or eight you just want to be able to stand up there Those yeah your words. so there's nothing about the particular design or style that requires eight feet it's not like there's some structural issue? No, I don't believe so. Okay. It's just a, it was a question. It's a Gambrel style. I made it that style to, to be able to utilize as much uh, space up there as possible to, for storage. Chair, I have a question as well. Um, the, if I'm looking at the right page, that's what you're talking about. It's yeah. an example. I pulled it off the internet just to give you an idea. That's fine. How do you get to this? How do you get up into the rafters, as it, as you, as it were? Ben was talking about, um, you know, one of those pull-down stairs. Um, A fairly temporary measure to get yeah. one location to the second. Right. Nothing fixed that no. will connect the two. No, I mean, unless you call that fix, it's an attic stair that pulls down, with, you know, springs and jazz. Thank you. The way I would get stuff up there, though, is with, a, with an opening on the second floor, um, you know, block and tackle kind of arrangement if it's... Uh, I, I have a couple of antique um, uh, bureaus that are being stored outside right now, and they're actually, I think, a little valuable. <laughs> I kind of like to get them out of them. Uh, sorry, I, have, I do have a follow-up question. What's the height of the house? It's two-story. Uh, I don't know exactly how high it is from grade. It's, it's, a, it's a full two-story house, probably. With probably five feet atop the second story. Oh, there's a full, full second story. It's 25 not, feet thereabouts? Yeah. Yeah, it was just, um, we just put a second floor on it. It was like the rest of the capes there with a little sort of attic second floor, but we actually put a real second floor on it. This, this is right on the, excuse me? Yeah. This is right on the line. I assume your neighbor doesn't care, right? She's, she's not right here. Now she's in Italy, but we discussed it before. And, uh, my neighbors across the street offered to come down and, and be a cheering squad for me. <laughs> I was going to go around and get um, signatures from all of them, but I just ran out. <coughs> can, can you touch on... It's your foot. <laughs> can you touch on what... Um, what views there there might be, or or why this would not affect views? That's one of the one of the standards we have to look at. That, right. that there won't and be any impacts on views. So I can't see it. Um, even shadows could could be a problem. Um, you know, I was thinking of that, but there's nothing back there really. And, um, 
my neighbor's house, she doesn't have any view to the backyard and the people behind me, I mean, they're not really looking at anything but the back of my house. So. Okay. For, for the record, I had one phone call regarding the application inquiring about it and at the end of the call the gentleman said he supports the application i had no other correspondence from neighbors and and this was definitely the largest butter notice we've ever done with a 500 foot radius and the size of these lots i'm sorry what did you say it was the largest butter notice that we've ever I seen see. now, okay. that i've ever seen But if law number 129 or 128 decides to do a similar thing, it's going to be bigger. It's a big, more than that radius. Yeah. <laughs> any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Buckley. Uh, any public comment? Hearing no public comment, I'd like to open it up for board discussion. Um, it seems like the the main issue before the board is whether or not um, it is larger than the original structure as determined by non-conforming floor area and volume. Is that basically? Floor area? Floor area. Floor area is exactly the same, right? It's just on the same footprint. The original well, the footprint is exactly the same. Under that provision, it says that the footprint has to be the same and the floor area can't increase. And so his... So I would contend that his floor area is increasing slightly because he's getting that headroom on the second floor, which is what brought him here. If he would have gone three feet lower, you wouldn't have seen it. Mm -hmm. okay. so is, have, the, is the fear? Oh, go ahead. I have sort of, I guess I throw this out. Um, as usual, I'm sort of thinking about precedent and some of the issues we've had and we'll have before us. Um, this is clearly for storage. That's all the gentleman has said. I mean, is it worth thinking about taking him up on his off, of reducing the eight to seven or six and a half, so that clearly it can only be used for storage? And the next time somebody comes in and wants to build a garage and have it eight feet high, and we're not, it's a quite a different design, and we're not so sure of it. It's like, yeah, the thing we approved is only for seven feet or seven and a half. It's really for storage. I don't feel strong about that, but if I'm making any sense, that would be the question, to protect ourselves from a pre precedent point of view to make sure, indeed, this is storage space over a garage. It's not a second floor. I don't think we, I don't think the use matters. I, I think there are, there are clear um, sort of criteria that we need to look at, including you know, the septic system, which clearly this isn't going to have an impact on. The type and amount of vegetation to be removed, which will be none. Uh, but, it, but it's number two. It's whether or not the proposed, the proposed structure will increase the nonconformity. And it would increase the nonconformity if it is additional floor area. So if that, if having the height of that if having the height of the building. Right, but we're allowing additional floor area and, and we're, we're looking at this criteria to decide whether or not to allow to add that additional floor area. Whether or not that floor area is being used as storage or... As no, I, think, I, I don't think we're... I think if, it's, if this were only a, one, a pure one-story building, we wouldn't be allowing it. There's no additional floor area. Right, we, it, that, wouldn't be was, it wouldn't be here. Beyond that which was already there. Right. In the structure that is being replaced. Sure. And Ben would, have, ben would issue a building permit for that. Right. So, so we're here because he's proposing to increase the floor area. Well, right. that's the argument. Is, is, is this increasing the floor area? Yes, is, according is to Ben. Right. Ben, ben feels it is increasing the floor area. Yeah. Right. If we agree with Ben, then we deny. No. This. Then we look at this. We're, we're allowed to approve that increase in floor area as long as this criteria is met, including there'll be no impact on views. Uh, the, the, and we consider the type and amount of vegetation to be removed. We consider um, the physical condition and type of foundation present. I don't think so. I think, I think the, the increase in floor area is separate. And I think if the floor area increases, I think 
the, the findings of fact number one, those are all required regardless of whether or not we're increasing the floor area or not. Number two is, is the nonconformity increasing? Right. I disagree. So, well, the nonconformity is not increasing. We, we have that long definition of increase of nonconformity. Okay. Which, uh, which states the structure has okay. to physically get closer okay. to the property okay. line. So, so the nonconformity would not be increasing, not increasing in this situation. Right. building on the exact same footprint with the exact same setback as the garage prior. So is the question whether or not this is a replacement because of the height? The, uh, it's, this is the same review as we've heard a few of these sure. where you, you just take into consideration size of the lot, slope okay. of the land, potential for okay. soil erosion, and it seems to be pretty straightforward under the, under the circumstances. Yeah, I, it seems to me the only criteria that may that this may have an impact on that we're to look at would be um, impact on views, which is why I asked the question and the, the applicant stated it. There would be yeah, no significant the, views impacted and we haven't heard any abutters say anything to the contrary. So in my mind, um, it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And okay, no, I, 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 I'll support it. I, I hear you. So, um, example, so you, uh, the applicant First, the whole pictures, three, three pictures of different structures on the street. Example number two is, looks like about the same. You know, yeah, can you tell us what page you're looking at? I'm oh, sorry, um, it's not numbered. Uh, second to last page of that, of his, uh, oh, the no, last page, sorry, last page. Photographs. Yeah, the photos of the three different garages. And number three to some extent, but also clearly number two looks like it would be kind of close to the same, the, you the, the correct width of the width. Maybe you don't have any of that. Okay. And that's the, basically the same. Here. Sure. So with this, so Ben, do we think that that, that was approved, that garage was approved as a non-conforming use or non-conforming structure rather? They're talking about these photos. Okay. So we do think that this, this garage here was approved as a non conforming structure? I, I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. I could find out pretty easily. Uh, my interpretation of the zoning is, well, you know, that in order, if there was a typical one-story garage, which is typical of that neighborhood, if someone wanted to rebuild that with a second story, they'd need to be 10 feet from the side property line. Okay, so this may be Maybe that one's 10 feet from the right, side property know. line. Oh, yes, yeah, <laughs> Maybe it came to the zoning board yeah. in okay. the past to be built. I'm not sure. But if we can't control, so if we can't specify what use the structure would have, right? I think it's for storage, but it's going to have this high ceiling. What is to stop him from? going at some point and actually finishing that as, not as a bedroom, but as... as but that's as, not... I think that's allowed. I, it's yeah, that's allowed. allowed. It seems allowed to me. It is allowed. Okay. He, he could finish that up there. He'd have a hard time getting a code compliant stairwell. He'd take up half your garage with a stairwell. <laughs> but uh, he could do that legally. Could we just look at the definition of floor area in the beginning of the, of the code? And sadly, the word attic is not part of that definition. And I just want to get your thoughts as to the definition, the purposes of what we can calculate uh, floor area as. And then there's an exclusion. The exclusion is excluding basement space, porches, and decks. So what's the, the rationale for that exclusion, whether there's a similar rationale for an attic? And the way I interpret an attic would be something that does not have permanent stairs. So are we in that category? So that the, the, the whatever the space is above the garage doesn't is falls within that exception, or is there something else going on at play here? So I, I wanted some insight from the rest of the panel if you had some thoughts on that. I mean, I think we 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 understand that we are increasing the floor area of the structure, but that's allowed. We can we can allow that. 
he's coming to us for the kind of that's one of the reasons he's coming to us. So I, I, I see it as I, there's not an issue. Well, um, uh, floor error is not an issue. Okay. Oh, it's not good. I, I think what, what Matt's arguing is maybe based on his interpretation, maybe this doesn't need to be here. Is that? If, 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 we, if, we, thank you, ben, if we include the word addict as an exception, after the word excluding basement space, comma, attic, porches, and decks, as long as that structure is less than 35 feet, it can be whatever he wants. Mine doesn't say that. I've included the word addict. It. it doesn't say addict, right? <laughs> Single-handedly revising the word. Yeah. So I wanted to get some insight. I'm on the new version here. I too am on the new version. And so on the one hand, it, it doesn't have to be here, or it, it does. And so this is one way for this application not to be here, is that if we interpret that phrase to say, storage base that does not have a permanent set of stairs or something like that. I, I don't think that's, that's open for interpretation. Well, I think that's very creative uh, and interpretive, <laughs> but, but not the language of the ordinance in, in front of us. And I, I think that, again, the, the language that we are dealing with here uh, under the reconstruction or replacement of this particular structure is, is sufficient for us to do what I think we're about to do, which is to go ahead and improve this. Um, and to be clear, this is a this is a, a this portion of the ordinance is about dimensions, is about distances from property lines. It's it's not about use. And I guess I want to ensure that we don't mix and match that too much because really we're we're just here not to talk about whether the applicant might eventually put in a bedroom or a kitchen or it's just it's, it's, it's just about replacing the garage at this point so um, I think at this stage I'd go ahead and, and make the motion to approve the request of Daniel Buckley at Five Orchard Road Matthew 21 lot 132 to replace and expand a 12 foot by 17 foot garage based on section 19-4-3 B3 of the zoning ordinance I'll second that all in favor all right, so that passes 6 nothing. Um, findings of fact, this is a request of Daniel Buckley of 5 Orchard Road, map U21, lot 132, to replace and expand a 12 foot by 17 foot garage based on section 19-4-3B3 section of the zoning ordinance. Two, Edward and Sybil McCarthy have a purchase and sale agreement on the subject lot. That's, uh, no, that's oh, yeah, that's, that's a typo on my part. Just skip that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, scratch number two. So number two now is the subject lot is a non-conforming lot in the RC zone. Three, a zoning board approval is required for is required because Mr. Buckley is adding a second floor space to the structure. Um, additional findings of fact: one, the zoning board of appeals has considered the size of the lot, the slope of the land the potential for soil erosion, the location of other structures on the property and on adjacent properties, the location of the septic system and other on-site soils suitable for septic systems, the impact on views and the type and amount of vegetation to be removed to accomplish the relocation. Two, the proposed structure will not increase the nonconformity of the existing structure. Three, the proposed structure is in compliance with the setback requirement to the greatest practical extent. All in favor of the findings and the additional findings? <laughs> It, wait, will it not increase the non-compliance? It will by increasing not, the floor space. It will not. No. All right. Do we need to find that it's being used as storage? Is that worthwhile? No. no. Okay. So all, all in favor? All right. Six nothing. Passes. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. And moving on to the last, uh, moving on to new business number three to hear the request of Edward and Sybil McCarthy to reconstruct a non-conforming structure within 75 feet of the ocean at 13 Lawson Road, map U8, lot 41A, based on section 19-4-4, B3 of the zoning ordinance. Good evening, board members. Sorry about that. Stephen Moore here this evening with Ted and Robin McCarthy <coughs> to talk about the application C 
that we submitted? I hate it that that's crooked. <laughs> Won't let that OCD kick in. Um, as you know from the meeting we had previously, Ted and Robin own the house on Lawson right here. They also own by separate deed the lot shaded in in green. RA zoning, shoreland overlay zoning. Um, it's one of the smallest lots in this 1939 subdivision. And on that existing lot, there are a couple of little structures that have been down there for quite some time. I can't help myself. <laughs> Sorry. This blow up shows the existing conditions on that lot. These are just enlarged versions of what you had in your packet. And on that 12,000, little over 12,000 square foot lot, there's an existing terrace and fireplace that are within 25 feet of the water. A small cabana shed, which you saw in that earlier photograph, and then a second shed. And that's the close-up of what's there in terms of the seawall, high water, the um, fireplace, terrace, cabana building, little shed behind. The things that are sort of difficult about this one are that the building sits within the side yard setback, which you know from that uh, exhibit we sent in to you. The closest point right now is that little wooden landing which is 8.9 feet away. The bulk of that building is a little over 12 feet. Immediately behind this, you can see where we've located these two large specimen trees that show up in that photograph. And then there's a wetland edge, what appears to be a wetland edge. It's a wet area edge. We haven't mapped it with a biologist, but it clearly is a low wet area that's saturated. And we went through and calculated existing volumes and existing square footages, both looking at it in terms of what's within the 75-foot setback, because clearly we're well in that 75, but also looking at it in terms of what was within the side yard setback. And we calculated those volumes and looked at those square footages. We had a couple of things in mind. Again, looking forward to the criteria that I'll discuss at the end of this. We talked about this when we talked about the house, which is that <laughs> okay, the green lot is here. All these abutting houses, not just the one owned by Ted Robin, but our abutters all been around and a whole series of new corridors, including the house across the street and the books on Lawson. All those views sort of cut right through the center of this site. And it's a key part of what goes on in this neighborhood. It's a key part of the understanding of the neighborhood about having that visual access to the cove. It's a key part of the understanding of Robin and Ted about what's important about the property. And so as we looked at those view corridors, that sort of volume and what we could do, we also had to evaluate that square footage. It's also in the side yard setback because we were trying to thread that needle of not increasing square footage in side yard in nonconformity, not increasing square footage in volume over 30% in uh, shoreland. <clears throat> so that little diagram just illustrates the pieces of that that are within that. What we ended up with to really be able to meet all those converging criteria was to really build this in situ because anything we did to move it out and into the lot started to encroach in that view corridor. This is the flattest part of the site. By building this essentially where it's shown here, which is the little over 12 away from the sideline, pulling out the entire fireplace and terrace to get rid of all those 
most egregious non-conforming pieces and set the front of the building back where it is now, which is 25.1. We then went through the, the math to arrive at this little model of the building, which essentially takes the 427 square feet that's there, shrinks it to 399.9. So we're actually decreasing square footage. And part of that is just our attempt to convince this board that we're doing the right thing by making it smaller in terms of square footage and keeping it less not, <clears throat> we're improving the side yard setback conformity, but we're not increasing the square footage within the side yard. We've improved the setback off high water. The only thing we did on this was to get some height. We had that front porch and then we had the little gable roof with a height of 12 feet because that gets us to that volume calculation of whatever it was, but it was 27.8% increase. And what we did is we calculated that to the bottom side of the structure to the underneath slab, so we have an accurate picture of that volume. So what we're proposing is this little structure that's a little over 16 by 24, that's a simple um, gable roof the side chimney and a little front porch. Again, keeping it in scale and character with what was there, but just making it more available for headroom on the inside. The one discussion point we've had from an abutter was there was a concern that the chimney, as we're showing it, is 15 feet high. Um, as you may or may not know, code requires the top of the chimney to be at least two feet higher than the adjoining ridge. We are three feet higher. One of the abutters is concerned that she would like to see that down at 14. So I will go on record as saying we will lower the chimney to 14 feet in the event that this moves forward this evening. Um, <clears throat> so we've sort of threaded those needles very carefully to arrive at a simple, functional little building that McCarthy's really just want to use as their place to get down by the water, sit in the chairs, and look at it. No bathroom. No internal plumbing, no rental, no other uses in this except for Ted and Robin to get down next to the shore. With respect to those <clears throat> specific criteria, we um, included in our submission to you a detailed response. With respect to lot size, I mean it is tiny, there's two other lots that are close to this in terms of size, but it's one of the smallest ones. It's served by uh, Woodcock Lane and Paper Street. And it has those unusual characteristics of just having virtually no real building window available. We marked it in one of our earlier diagrams. And when you take those setbacks and the 75 foot as defined by your ordinance, it's really quite a small building window on this lot. Um, with respect to the slopes, this is sitting on the levelest piece of this relatively flat little parcel. So we're sitting on a flat area that's about half a percent. In terms of erosion control, obviously we'll follow the best management practices for erosion controls, but given the flatness of where we're building and the very small construction footprint area, that soil erosion is de minimis. With respect to the views, it's really the views that pushed us to where we are, which was the request to come to you for that in situ really reconstruction to get out of that view corridor and not uh, cause issues with the neighbor. And in terms of the neighbors, there's been discussion and talking points. I do have copies for the board of letters or notes of approval from three abutters, which I'll just pass you just for the record. And my final comment to you, in the discussions with the neighbors, there's been some concern that Ted and Robin are trying to make a case by seeking this reconstruction approval from this board that in fact this is a separate and buildable lot and this is just a stepping stone to making this lot <coughs> become a buildable lot through the action of the zoning board. That is not the case at all. We're here very simply to say to you, 
we'd like to reconstruct this as we're showing in the volume and the size we're showing and the location we're showing because we believe it meets the criteria set forth in your ordinance for doing this. The comments that were made in our cover letter and in the application about the building window and the capability of some soils on the site were not intended to persuade you that this was buildable. They were intended to indicate why we thought it was important to not build up in that upper area. So in terms of the record, we've told the neighbors we make it abundantly clear to you this evening that for the record, no one's tested the soils. There's the really not applicable sections about sewerage and soils in the building window. And the fact that we have the information to put in front of you for at least some of the abutters and the fact that the abutters aren't here, I think would speak to the board in terms of the work that Ted and Robin have done to make sure that this comes before you in a way that doesn't have a lot of public opposition or concerns. So with that, I think Ted and Robin, I've covered it. Are you satisfied? Are you satisfied with that? Are we, are we good, Ted? <laughs> I'll turn it back to the board. I don't mean to be glib about this, but no bathroom. Any questions? I, I should just mention preliminarily, I'll go through the same thing I went when you guys weren't here in front of us. I think it was last month that my wife and I did reside at 13 Lost Road for a short period of time. <laughs> Temporary rental. Uh, we didn't work with these folks at all as with the previous owner, so I don't feel like there's any conflict. Just wanted to put that on the record again. Do you have a full kitchen or did you just have a microphone? <laughs> <laughs> it's a full kitchen, hardly. Uh, you guys did some good work there. I drove by the other day. It was good. And I will tell you that this was a particularly mouse infested. Uh, I moved the mattress out of that little cabana. And, uh, disrepair is, is, is putting it mildly. <clears throat> so, so, any Question. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's got a little confused here. So the the footprint of this structure is not going to increase. In fact, it's going to decrease. That is correct. Will decrease. And you're going to move it to the east a little bit. Correct. Okay. So what's the big deal? Is it that the roof will the roof line will go up and therefore increase the volume? Is that what we're really looking at here? The volume does, because we have a volume increase mm -hmm. in the shoreland zone within the setback, we're under the 30%, but that's in essence what brings us here. In addition to that side yard issue, I believe, Ben. Yeah, the primary purpose, if, if, if you want to demo and rebuild any structure within 75 feet of the ocean, you're here. Okay. It, got a question for you, Ben. <clears throat> We've got a couple things going on here. We've got the shoreland zone. And we've all, we also have the side setback, non-conformance with the side setback. So are we looking at both the, oh, what is it, 443B four, 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 and 444B? Four, 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 no, yeah. sorry, 1943 and 1944. Four. We're looking at those. I mean, are we looking at, which I believe we are, the side setback mm -hmm. issue as separate from the shoreland zone issue? Well, that was a minor oversight in the planning for this. We, we didn't pick up on that until after the application was submitted, the, the side yard setback. We were just really focused on the shoreland zone. Mm -hmm. If you look at the criteria for the two approvals, they're identical. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think the board is safe. I, I added a finding to say that you considered the side yard setback, and there's also uh, they're also not increasing the floor area within the side yard setback. So I feel relatively comfortable with, with, with the board moving forward on it. Okay. But, you know, your question, question a good point. Yeah, great. Question for Mr. Moore. How, how does this, um, so if we're looking at 1943, um, it's 1944. Right. Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, but I'm gonna look at 1943 relative to the side setback. How does this meet the side setback to the greatest extent? Practical. What <clears throat> what we had looked at as we were designing this was that right now we have that small platform 
It's 8.1 away. That's the side yard setback sketched in there. Right now, when you include all of the structures in that side yard setback, we're at 360 something, forgive me. Yeah, no, and I, I see where you're going. I understand it's a reduction in area that is non conforming, and the, I think the, the, the encroachment in, is in fact being reduced as well, the, the distance to right. the uh, abutting property, abutters property line is increasing. Um, but the, couldn't, the, it, couldn't it be moved outside of the setback entirely? It very well could. The issue for us is the, the moment we start moving out away from that side here, we start to encroach into that view corridor. And it was a conscious decision on our part to trade off side yard setback against view encroachment. It's just, it comes down to just that simple effect for us. It, it made some logical sense to us that we sit in those footprints, but I assure you if we had that out into that view corridor, we'd have a, a different set of circumstances here this evening based on the comments from the neighbors. So it was really view protection. Okay, thank you. Ordinance. This is 19443. I just want to make sure I'm in the right. Yep, B3. B3. Doesn't the ordinance state if the total amount of floor area and volume of the original structure can be relocated or reconstructed beyond the required setback area? No portion of the relocated or reconstructed structure shall be replaced or constructed at less than the setback requirement for a new structure. Does that couldn't the structure, I understand it would block the view corridor, but couldn't it be rebuilt there? It, it could be moved out and made conforming, but then it would be in the view corridor, yes. Which is one of the criteria that you evaluate for the reasonableness of that application. The I'm just concerned about that language. What section are you reading? 19.44B3. Uh, it's on page 43 of the new ordinance. And Josh, what's, what's, the, what's so the exact language in here? That you'll if, if the total amount of floor area and volume of the original structure can be relocated or reconstructed beyond the required setback area, no portion of the relocated or reconstructed structure shall be replaced or constructed at less than the setback requirement for a new structure. And in this case, the, the the total amount of floor area and volume of the original structure could be relocated fully within the setback area. It, it would be blocking these views, yeah. but we're stuck with the language of the ordinance. I don't. Yes, Mr. Moore, maybe you can point us to why we should be considering views. Um, I, I, I agree with you. In, in, in the side setback issue, I think the views come into play. The criteria is a little different, but in the, in the uh, I believe based on our, our reading, we thought we would have relief through this board for that side yard setback as long as we met those criteria, which is why we were relying. Yeah, but now we're talking about the, the resource protection zone. The shoreline zone. The shoreline zone. Yeah, they're, they're back in. They're oh, thank sorry. you. You're yeah, back yeah. in shoreline. So what Josh zone. is talking about now is thank you. you're reconstructing this with portions of it in the shoreline zone. Mm -hmm. Our ordinance says if, pos if it's possible to re reconstruct it outside, entirely outside the shoreland zone. No, that not, no. If the, total, it, if the total amount of floor area and volume of the structure can be relocated and reconstructed beyond the required setback area, not right. outside the shoreland zone. Okay, I'm sorry. Not you're right, you're right. Out, outside that 75 outside foot. The 75 yes, foot outside resource. the 75 yes. foot setback. But again, I would have to rely on my reading in terms of the ordinance that the board has the ability to grant that relief in that same 
section as long as those criteria are met. Because the same criteria apply for relief in this area, in shoreland, as they do for side yard. Am I reading that incorrectly? There is a later paragraph that skip down two paragraphs. Determining whether the building reconstruction or replacement meets the setback to the greatest practical extent, the Zoning Board of Appeals shall consider in addition to the criteria in section 1944B2 relocation, the physical condition and type of foundation, if, if any. Um, but I don't, I don't feel like that trumps the language Josh just read. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't either. Because that language that, that Josh read is not necessarily qualified by, by what I just read. And that was, if then thou shalt is basically what it says. Yeah, I, I just, again, I'm somebody please point out some area in the ordinance that would allow us to do this, but <laughs> that language doesn't provide any wiggle room to me. So, so if, if the structure were rebuilt, like everybody can agree that the structure could be rebuilt, but you put it in the same exact spot with the same exact footprint with no increase in volume, and that would be okay. No, so, no, no. Not, if, have, not if it's okay. possible to put it's it outside. It's possible that, to okay, rebuild it, but move it yeah. towards the center of the property. So basically, if we're looking at, uh, right now, it looks like, the, the, it looks like it's 121 feet along from the ocean part to, uh, I'm sorry. Well, so it had to move back. It, it, would, it would move smack dab in the middle of, of I know. the area. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, the irony here is that, uh, you know, under Main Law, and I think it bears itself out in our ordinance as well, views aren't really considered as having a whole heck of a lot of importance. So, um, but I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm probably missed this. I'm not sure why this section applies. Because this the section is, it, this is, this section is non-conformance within the shoreland. Yeah, but this particular one. Because we're talking about a reconstruction or replacement. Yeah, but this has to do if it's destroyed. <laughs> yeah, I think we've, is it, I we've this reviewed. Is the section yeah. that we, oh, it's. Yeah, we, we've reviewed this sort of reconstruction. It would be destroyed under this. Tear it down. Under this section. Oh, it, it's. Exactly. <laughs> this is this is the section that the board's been using for years to address. So it's okay. It's, but no, it damage regardless of the cause. So if they tear this down and want to build, I, I completely building, understand what you're saying. Wait, wait, wait. That counts. I, okay, we got to say this out loud because I don't. <laughs> so they can leave this junky little thing where it is, but if they replace it with something nice, they can't put it back in the same place. That's what the ordinance says. They can repair and maintain. They can repair and maintain. They cannot replace. But yes, that no, gives no, a lot of wiggle room to repair it. That doesn't make any sense. As we've seen. Yes. <coughs> May I ask him a question? Yeah. Have, have you fully analyzed that, if that, it that, is? That just doesn't, that's not the intent of the section. I mean, with one year of the date of said damage or destruction, I mean, that's. Well, I, I, I agree with you to some extent. It, that you know the the ordinance does seem to say that if you can demonstrate these criteria you can replace it and then there's that monster sentence that it says if it can go back it has to go back uh, have you fully analyzed whether the structure could go back I mean you, you, you have a dicey situation with two lots septic system RA zone setbacks I mean we didn't fully go down that path when, uh, when we examine this. And when we looked at this lot and looked at the RA zoning and understood that, that green shaded area is an area that on face value appears to be buildable under those RA standards. It happens to occupy our soil site where soil for a septic might go. I, I recall asking you if you had the correct normal high water line, and I wasn't sure that you did because the, the, the definition changed. 
we didn't see it as a critical part of the application because correct you the, the normal high water line you were asking to be inside of that regardless but with the increase in the normal high water line that, it, that we took it in field measured it based on debris line we don't we took debris line plus the four feet but we didn't actually run it out to a level that I would want to rest on in terms of the board making a finding that we have a buildable window on this inside of here. If that, in fact, is a critical issue, what I want to do is table, go back and find that and lean in on that with much more accuracy rather than relying on a tape measure and a, and a one shot. Yeah, agreed. You may well find that for whatever reason it is not, in fact, possible to relocate the entire uh, structure so that it doesn't violate a setback. Um, so if that's, if that's what I'm hearing from the board, that, in fact, we must comply with that particular section, then I would ask to table, let us go back, actually do the field survey accurately to communicate back to you what that 75-foot setback truly means and look at it more than just on paper with the tape and then we can address that squarely. Agreed. Robin? Basically the issue is inside the shoreland zone if you are reconstructing a structure and if that structure can be reconstructed so it doesn't encroach on any of the required setbacks, then it mu that's the only place where you can put it. You actually have to move it so it doesn't encroach into any of the required setbacks. And so in this case, we haven't made any findings, but there's concern that you actually may be able to move the structure back into, into the mid center of the property so it won't encroach on any of the setbacks. Obviously, that's where you're trying to avoid building because of the view issue. Um, and, and again, we haven't made any findings because I don't think the measurements have been taken and it, I don't, it, it doesn't sound like it's been considered to the full extent whether or not it could be built there. Well, whoa. It, it could be, it could be built there, yes. Uh, we don't want to do that to all our neighbors. It would take their view and something that is very important to people in that neighborhood. Mike, you maybe can speak to that. So we would not do that. We would withdraw our, our application or whatever. But this doesn't, I wonder if you could make it make sense to me. This place is falling down. Well, it, it can be repaired. Yes. It just, but it the just floor can't. needs repair, the walls, the windows, the roof, every single bit of it. What is the difference between repair and maintenance, which I know we're allowed to do, and rebuild it? It's. I mean, what's before the board is rebuilding. Is a rebuild. So that, that's what we're considering. Um, I mean, the board can't really speak to the extent to which, you know, when something goes from a repair to a rebuild, but what's before the board is replacing. Okay. Yeah, it, and, and, that's, and that's just, that's when you kind of have the restriction that we're talking about. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add that the, the state of Maine, and I think the town of Cape Elizabeth places huge importance in shoreland zone areas. And I think it's the intent of the ordinance to reduce these nonconformities or eliminate these nonconformities when possible. So when you're coming along and reconstructing, rather than allowing a reconstruction within that shoreland zone, the ordinance says, hey, let, let's eliminate that nonconformance, move it outside the shoreland zone, and, 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 and that's the higher, off. the higher priority. Yeah. in terms of the ordinance. Sort of a higher level of scrutiny, almost a higher standard for, okay. for anything that's within that shoreland. And shoreland zoning is, uh, in large part, um, directed by the state. Uh, the town's, our local ordinance has to comply with 
with really DEP's uh, requirements for shoreland zoning. Uh -huh. So what about Mr. Crawford's point that... Doesn't make sense. That, I mean, it, yeah, this doesn't, it just doesn't make sense in a way that we're, there, there's, it's an eyesore, it's really ugly. Uh, why not fix it up so it's, without enlarging it, so that it's nice, doesn't and, and it? I mean, that's, again, if, if what you're doing is repairing it, okay. you're, you're certainly permitted to do it. And, and I mean, it, just the board's job is, you know, to basically apply the ordinance. Yep. So when we have language like this, we don't, we don't really have any wiggle room. And, and I, mean, I, I mean, I think the whole board very much appreciates what you're trying to do and what the proposal is trying to do in consideration of your neighbors and your neighbors' view. Um, I think it's a laudable, you know, effort. But even if this doesn't kind of maybe make sense to you on its face, this is, this is the okay. ordinance that yep. we apply. Yep. So. I, I can, uh, hold on, Ted. I, <laughs> And if, if we do table this, then you'll have the opportunity to go back to, to your think corner about and it. kind of consider some more how you want to deal with it, what you want to do, and maybe there's another angle okay. that, that we're we're missing that will be borne out with a little bit more research, measurements, etc. Yeah. Okay. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute, please. Um, well, that's all right. I, I have a scheme. <laughs> um, do you have this one up there? In your... I do. Can you see that? Sort of. Yeah. Well, that, that does that show the exist the one that shows the existing buildings underneath. Anyway. Um, Okay, let's okay, let's go back to this one. Yeah, that's close. That's close enough. No, we want to be able to see them clearly. Yeah, flip it over, okay? If I understand the zoning ordinances correctly, you guys, Josh, you guys have to help me. Um, the little building on the the. If I'm looking at this correctly, the new building basically um, has the same uh, east-west um, footprint as the old one, correct? So by the way the statue works, they could extend the old building without encroaching on in other words, if you tear down the little building on the right and extend the main building, you could do that. I, I would. I don't think so. Okay, that's reconstruction. What? I, well, I would just suggest. Well, I, that let, let me just follow through with this. Okay. okay. If I understand the way the ordinance works, you could extend the main building to the right to its current to its proposed configuration. Correct within the terms of the zoning. That, that, that isn't the application, though. No. Yeah, I understand that. So I, I guess what I, I'm just a little bit, I'm a little bit uncomfortable suggesting okay. to the applicants ways that they could potentially right. get around the ordinance. I think if, they're, if they'd like to table this, they can kind of go back and decide how they want to approach this again, if they'd like to approach it again and then bring a new application to the board. But you know, right now, what's before the board, we can't approve. Um, Which is why I think the, the correct direction here is we would like the board's interpretation this evening. We would like the table to let us regroup, understand those pieces, get that back in a couple of dimensions, and then come back at this. It, and I don't know if it's more appropriate to table or withdraw or if it matters. Ted, you had a comment. For now, but uh, does tabling it keep the same application? I mean, you could 
it's, it would, my guess is you'll ultimately be withdrawing it because I think as it stands now, it won't be approved. So it might be withdrawing it if you table it now, if we table it now and then tomorrow you decide to withdraw it, you withdraw it. Correct. That's why I'd like time to sure. caucus with them and make some of those decisions and then chat with them and go back and read that specific section of the ordinance because we looked at that and then yeah. moved and beyond it. Yes, absolutely. At least one effort at uh, interpreting the ordinance So well, here's the sweet little that's, that's what people see. This is what they're seeing now in that, in that part of my property. This is the new road. Right by the seawall. And you can see it here. If you can see it clearly, it's ugly. If we rebuild it and put it here, we're encroaching. Not only I mean, people's access to the ocean, it is an encroachment. My argument is we can't move it there without encroaching on, on common sense in our neighbors. Not just the view corridor so much. This is the unique, this is what it looks like from the seawall. And then we'd be right here. This tree. No, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think the board recognizes all of that. And I don't think we can do this in my argument. Well, and, and I, I just think I think the board table it up. and you can just discuss it, and but we, we can't approve it based on the language in the ordinance. So, I mean, we, we could move forward to a decision, but then it's going to be denied, yeah. and then, you know, it seems like the best course of action would be to. The, the, word, the words that were read were that you can't move that you must. And that's, a, that's, in the phys, that's in the physical sense. If you physically can't move it. Can't is not defined very clearly. Can should take this argument into consideration. I believe it is common sense. The issue, the issue to speak on behalf of the board has a whole series of decisions wherein they've rendered decisions on this language previously. And there's case law, so they can't sidestep a direct reading of the language. So I, I, sorry if I spoke to no. the board, but in plain terms, their hands are tied the way they've, the way they've looked at that. So. I have a very good sense of it, Ted, from this. I understand. I think in working with, with Ben yes. moving forward, we'll see. Yeah. I, you know. That's why my sense is table it, give us a ability to go back through and look at this because, in fact, there may be a way to document that there isn't a building window. So I just right. I need to rely on some science to help us understand that. Sure. Sure. So do we need a motion to table it? Probably. Uh, maybe I'd like to move to table it. I'll entertain a motion to table it. I'll move to table the application. Uh, all in favor? All right. <laughs> Thank the you. The application is tabled. Is it coming? Thank you. <laughs> no rental unit, no bedroom, <laughs> no dwelling unit. <laughs> yeah, but there will be. You got your leech field. Right. right. No, I know. Seriously, so you could really, you could use that and really <laughs> game, game the system. I'm not sure, Josh. So, Mr. Chair, we move on to the next item. Oh, jeez, sorry, we're not. Oh, oh yes, please. Somebody want to. Uh, the final order of new business is election of a chair and secretary for a one-year term. Any volunteers? <laughs> I'm going to nominate Josh Carver. 
We actually tabled it last time. I, no, I, I saw it come back. <laughs> <laughs> I watched it on YouTube. I wanted to see who was replacing me, <laughs> and you tabled it. Yeah, we, all, you? we couldn't nominate an elected <laughs> in your absence. We could at least have the Colin Harris <laughs> Uh, I will add that Mike did a fantastic job. He did. Yes, he did. There is a, a man in the running. As <laughs> um, I'll, I'll do it for another year if you guys want. That, that might be it, though. That'll be three. So. I think you did a nice job. Well, how do we uh, formalize that? Move uh, the nomination of Josh Carver as chairman of the uh, Zone Board of Appeals. Second. Second. Yep. Discussion. Is there a conversation, discussion? All in favor? I'm sorry, I'm assuming we do. <laughs> just, just solely for the election. <laughs> All right. Um, who's the secretary? Who was the secretary? Joanna. Who's Joanna? Oh. Who would like, what does the secretary do? Nothing. <laughs> I'll be secretary. What? Te te technically, the secretary <laughs> records minutes and does findings and everything, but. Myself and the minute secretary essentially do the secretary's job. Right. Michael. Second. All, all in favor? All right, that passes. Is there a treasurer position? <laughs> <laughs> um, and moving on, communications, discuss 2016 meeting schedule. I yeah. think the, the standard. I think the standard is fine. We, We've, we've done that thing where we have the Thanksgiving and Christmas meetings and we meld them together. First week of the, December. I, right? think, I think two years in a row we've lost two people due to that concert. Yes. So yes. I've missed it twice in a row. So, I, so that concert may be that second Wednesday. So we may try to get. Maybe as we get closer, I'll keep, we'll keep so an eye on So our December account. meetings yeah. to be determined. Yeah. Maybe, okay. maybe we do it the second week of December or something. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, or I not. Because uh, it's always moved to a Wednesday, right? When well, we the problem it. is, that, yeah, the Tuesdays, other Tuesdays are occupied by, you know, council and planning board, so moving to a Tuesday is, is difficult because Tuesday's the usual meeting night. Could you like a Monday? Yeah. Right. I'll, I'll, well, yeah. I'll, I'll talk to the clerk. She keeps the calendar, and, uh, and maybe we'll try to hammer out the December meeting. I'd like to set the calendar sure. sooner rather than later. So maybe we'll look into it and I'll, I'll send you guys an email. Yeah, but it has been two years in a row where we've had that meeting and it's been the same night as the middle yeah. school concert. So. Yeah. From a timing perspective, is there any interest or would it even be a possibility to move the meeting a little bit earlier in the evening or is that, does that not work for folks? Nice I just throw it out there. Have some dinner and then come. It's true. I can go one way or the other. I just you know, live and work very close by, so it doesn't really matter to me. Yeah. I'm okay with I mean, I could do six. I don't, I mean, I don't, I'm kind of a good one. But seven's fine. All right. Seven's fine. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else? All right, we're adjourned.